Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. Ten years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020 and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. 
That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Wow, thank you so much. It is so good to be back. Are you feeling fiery? You are, are you on fire? That's good. I knew I could count on you, Seattle. This is the city that made Shell oil blink. This is the city that was the first to elect democratic socialists before it was cool. This is the city that put the fight for 15 on the map before that was a thing. And I believe that this is the city that's going to lead the country by introducing a truly transformational, intersectional, justice-based, frontline-led Green New Deal. <laughs> before the rest of the country goes to the polls. That's the Seattle that I missed. I want to thank everybody at Town Hall for welcoming back here, me back here once again, especially Edward Vulture. I want to thank my old friends at one of this country's truly magnificent independent booksellers, Elliot Bay. And I want us all to send some love to the groups that have tables outside set up, and I hope that you will all make some time to stop by, sign up, pick up some information. We've got great groups out there, my dear friends at 350 Seattle. Um, the incredible Sunrise Movement, who I've partnered with, yes. We love Sunrise. Um, they put the Green New Deal on the national stage, and the Green New Deal builds on the long hard work of climate justice organizations who have been doing this work for many years, groups like Got Green, that's out there. Front and Centered. Community to community, thank you all for being here and for all the work that you do every day, lighting fires, for justice and transformation. I also am so excited to be here with Council Member Teresa Mosqueda. We are gonna be, yes, 
Um, so I'm not going to take up too much time uh, talking because I really can't wait to, to be in conversation. Um, I'm just going to put out a few framing ideas for you. On Fire came out a week ago, <clears throat> and so I've been talking to journalists, and I get these very strange questions these days, sort of aggressive questions about why I'm hopeful, um, as if there's something really wrong with me for that. Um, and the truth is, you know, I, I, I feel a range of different emotions on any given day. Um, you know, there's raw terror. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of that. Um, there's grief. There's real grief for what we are already losing and what we will never get back. Um, but I do admit that I do feel some hope. What I am saying in this book is not that I know we're going to win. I don't even say that our chances are good, to be honest with you. What I'm arguing is that we have a chance. We have a chance. We have a pathway. If we work incredibly hard, if we are truly on fire for the justice that we need, if all of those stars align, then we could win the kind of future that we tried to lay out in that film, which is not a perfect future. But it's a hell of a lot better, not just than some climate apocalypse that we can all imagine, but better than what a lot of people are living right now, right? And that is what this approach to our climate justice, to our climate crisis that centers justice is all about. So, what I think about most these days is really the weight of our historical moment. What it means for all of us to be alive and breathing in 2019. Now you all know, um, I presume, the kind of timelines that we're up against. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with this path-breaking report that got everybody's attention almost exactly a year ago. It was a report focused on what it would take to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they highly recommended that we do that considering what we're already seeing having warmed the planet by one degree Celsius. Um, what they said is that we need to cut global emissions in half in 12 years. Now that was a year ago. So that means that we have just 11 years. And they were very clear, the scientists in this report, um, that this kind of emission reduction, to achieve that in just 11 years, is not something you can do with a single climate policy, with a single carbon tax or some other carbon pricing scheme. That plays a part in it, to be sure. But what they said was that this requires unprecedented transformation in every aspect of society. Um, climate scientists don't usually speak that directly, but they have learned that they're not going to get our attention unless they really spell things out for us. So unprecedented transformation in buildings, agriculture, energy, transformation, transportation, and so on within this very short window. And when you hear, you know, 11 years, 12 years, there's something like the mind wants to believe that we can start in 11 years. So it's always worth underlining that they say we have to have gotten it done in 11 years, right? The transformation done. And those are global targets which means that in wealthy countries like the United States, which is the world's largest historical emitter of greenhouse gases, there we have to do more. We have to move faster to make some atmospheric space for the countries that have only just begun to emit carbon on an industrial scale. So if every ounce of our energy was focused on the, this kind of transformation of the bones of our society, it would be really hard to pull off. A truly epic task, but possible, they stress. But here's the part of our historical moment 
that is truly terrifying. That at this very moment, when we have this tight and unyielding deadline, the men who are rising to the highest office in country after country are not just failing to embrace this transformational agenda, not just failing to douse the flames of climate disruption, but they are active planetary arsonists. They are burning the planet with glee. Trump, and you know, too many examples of his ravaging of environmental laws to mention here, his cracking open of public lands, oceans, the Arctic, to limitless drilling, his eyeing of Greenland um, for its oil and gas reserves beneath the melting ice. Um, and then there's Bolsonaro, his buddy, who told the UN that the Amazon isn't actually burning. Um, not on fire at all. Business as usual. A lot of these buddies of Trump's are in the US right now for, for, for the UN General Assembly. There's Scott Morrison, another friend from Australia, Prime Minister of Australia. This guy, when he was um, Natural Resources Minister, came to Parliament with a huge hunk of coal and just caressed it and told people not to be afraid of it um, as a rationale for why he believed they should dig the world's largest coal mine, the Adani mine. Um, and then there's Modi. Howdy Modi, right? They had the big rally. Um, also, an enthusiastic ravager of the natural world, Duterte, another one. These strong men are rising in this moment. And they have a sort of a common MO. If you look at what they're doing, if you look at the way they attack the press, at the way they use technology, the way they wage war on the very idea of objective truth, right? All of them have this formula of identifying an in-group in their countries, a circle of the protected, right? In this country, it's the MAGA crowd, it is the, you know, the, the white, the wealthy, the so-called real Americans that are invoked. But it's, you know, for Modi, it is, he has his in-group, the real Indians who are Hindu, not the Muslims, millions of whom are being stripped of citizenship, not people in Kashmir. The point is, is you know, when you are inside the fire, as people are in the United States, we can think that it's only this country, but it isn't only this country. This is a global fire that is happening. And these tactics of defining the in and then the out groups, right? Inside the country and also on the border. So the other is the threat, right? The other is the, the terrorist, the disease, the invader. We have these two different kinds of fires, the climate disruptions, the very literal fires, and you know a lot about that here in Seattle because you've had a few summers in a row, not this past summer, but the one before and the one before that, where you were choked by smoke as we were in Canada across the border. Um, you know, in this book I write, uh, I have a chapter called Summer of Smoke about that summer of 2017 when the sun was that little red dot in the sky and, and children with asthma um, were suffering and elderly people were suffering respiratory illnesses and we started to think of our summers as seasons of smoke. So we have these very literal fires and we have the, these political fires that are also raging out of control, that are also spreading hatred, supremacist logics from country to country. And I guess what I'm saying to you is it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that at this moment where the climate crisis moves from being this future threat that we talked about off in the distance to being something that we are living, living here, but of course, we have it relatively easy compared to people in Mozambique, the, Baham Baham the Bahamas, Somalia, 
Seven, seven million people were internally displaced in the first six months of 2019. People are already, millions and millions of people are on the move directly because of climate change or because climate acts as an accelerant for armed conflict, another factor that is turning people against each other. I don't think it's a coincidence that as climate change becomes this lived reality, whether people claim to deny it or not, I, I don't believe that most people who claim they deny climate change really believe that our world isn't changing. I know Trump knows it's changing because he's had to modify his golf courses to deal with sea level rise. They just think they're going to be all right. So I don't think it's a coincidence that as the climate fires rage, these, these fires of hatred are also raging and these strong men figures come to power promising to build walls, concentration camps, waging war on their political opponents. And all of this, as people are attacking each other, leaves them free to get on with that real business at hand, the plundering of the last protected wilderness on this planet from the Amazon to the Arctic, which of course further fuels those planetary fires, the droughts and the superstorms and the floods, the fires that force millions to flee their arid lands and which intensify armed conflict, which forces more people to move. And so they pour millions into their militaries, their walls, their prisons, their camps, and they take that money directly out of climate assistance, in the case of the Trump administration, cut millions of aid to Central America, much of which was going to help drought-struck farmers in Guatemala and Honduras and moved it to this infrastructure of deportation and incarceration. These fires are connected. So I feel the weight of our historical moment. I feel it every minute of the day, but I do not feel hopeless. And that is because we do not live in a time of just two fires. We live in a time of three fires. There is a third fire, and it is our fire. And we have to believe that. We really have to believe in it. We have to believe in it, and we have to not be afraid to unleash it because our fires are not the fires of destruction and, an and annihilation. They are the fires of creation, of cleansing, of reparation. Our fires burn with love for the wonders of this planet and the people who live on it. Our fires are fiercely internationalist. We reject hate and the very idea that any human being can be illegal. Ours are the fires of the climate strikers, this global movement of children woven around the world, of young people standing up for each other. And on Monday, they organized the largest climate climate protest in the history of this planet, four million people on one day, and it's not over yet. Ours are the fires of the indigenous rights movements putting bodies on the line as they have always done to stop new oil and gas pipelines on both sides of the border in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Ours are the fires of the fossil fuel divestment movement which just last week won one of its biggest victories when the University of California system announced that it's $80 billion endowment portfolio, combined portfolio, was divesting from fossil fuels. And ours are the fires of the climate justice movement that worked for so long and so hard to lay the foundations for what is now called the Green New Deal. Ours are the fires of the Sunrise Movement, this young organization which takes its name from that ball of life creating fire in the sky um, that when the Democrats won the midterms didn't waste time any with 
congratulations, and occupied the office of Nancy Pelosi and demanded a Green New Deal. <clears throat> and since then, we have seen the political map completely redrawn. We have the majority of the, of the, of the contenders to lead the, the Democratic Party all pledging their allegiance to the Green New Deal, swearing not to take fossil fuel money, not all of them, but almost all of them. Um, this is a huge shift in only a matter of months. Ours are also the fires of Amazon workers for climate justice here in Seattle. This extraordinary development, this movement that has taken on the richest man on the planet, the man who stole the name of our most critical rainforest to build a company based on cardboard boxes, and they have him on the run. Because of their pressure and their courage in joining the climate strike, Amazon vowed last week to have net zero carbon emissions by 2040 to power its facilities and operations with 100% renewable energy by 2030 and by 100,000 electric delivery vans, which is pretty amazing. But to their enormous credit, um, the Amazon workers did not just say great, they said that's a nice start, went on strike anyway, and are pushing for not net zero, but actual zero emissions by 2030. Um, and to get Amazon to, um, to not fund climate politicians who deny climate change and not to do business with oil and gas companies. And if they could also keep Amazon from flooding Seattle City Council elections um, with their dirty money, that would be awesome too. I called the book on fire because that is what we need to be in this moment. We cannot be sort of in favor of beating these planetary arsonists. We have to be on fire with it. We cannot be sort of in favor of the Green New Deal. We have to be on fire for a Green New Deal. Monday's strikes were just the beginning. We need our fire to burn bright and hot enough to clear away all the debris standing in our way, standing in the way of our mission, which we must understand to be sacred. It needs to be hot enough to clear away the debris of the deniers, the ones who lie and confuse from money. It needs to be hot enough to clear away the debris of the distractors, getting us to focus on anything and everything but the fire. It needs to be hot enough to clear away the debris of the doomers, telling us it's all too late and why not just let it burn. Most of all, it needs to be hot enough to clear away the debris of the dividers, turning us against each other when we need to be more united, more powerful than we ever have been before. We do not have time to waver. We do not have time to wring our hands about how hard it is and how unlikely we are to win. We just have to tap into that superpower that kicks in when life is on the line and get it done. I'll leave you with the words of some of the climate strikers in the UK. They say, Greta was the spark, but we are the wildfire, and that's what we need to be. We have to be the wildfire. Thank you. Seattle, are we lucky or what? Welcome back to Seattle, Naomi Klein, award-winning author, called the most influential figure on the American left, and the godmother of the Green New Deal. Give it up one more time for Naomi Klein.
So I'm on fire. I know many of you are as well. And the planet has been on fire for years. Here we are having a conversation just four days after we saw the masses take to the street on a global scale. We saw this led by students here in Seattle, across our country, and across the globe. Four million people demanding climate action now. Let me hear you say climate action now. So the question that we have for you is, right here, we've been calling for action. You saw people, as you said, uh, take to their kayaks the last time you were here. I heard the folks at Town Hall say that they think that that was inspired by some of the words that you shared here the last time. And this is true organizing, what we've been doing in Seattle for years. The crowd that we saw at City Hall was multi-generational. It was multi-racial, and it was the largest crowd many of us have ever seen at Seattle City Hall calling for action. And we've done some things in City Hall. Uh, we have recently passed the Green New Deal, led by many of the organizations that you called out. Got Green, 350 Seattle, Front and Center, C2C, the Sunrise Movement. Let's give it up for these organizations who've been working for years. And this comes just a few years after you saw the most diverse coalition come together for a statewide initiative, Initiative 1631, which would have called for immediate action. Thanks to all of you for working on that. A diverse group of environmentalists, urbanists, uh, indigenous folks, labor unions. And here we are, and we know you have warned us against dangerous incrementalism. Help us understand, how can we act locally and think globally? Are there any good examples of local municipalities and how we can advance the call for a Green New Deal besides passing it and committing to those policies like we've already done? And more importantly, what are your words of advice for how we can build that power to fuse the flames that you talked about that we need to take on the global uh, effort? Yeah. Um well, first of all, it's such an honor to be in conversation with you. And yeah, I mean, Seattle, what's, what happens in Seattle, it trickles, it trickles east. <laughs> um, and it trickles up. And we're already seeing that, like even though um, the, the, the resolution, uh, you know, I, I considered it the most progressive carbon pricing scheme that that, that anybody has proposed. Um, and I don't support all carbon pricing, you know, carbon taxes, be precisely because um, they often are unjust. And if they're not just, then there will be a backlash to them. And we're, we've seen that in France. Um, you, we have a huge problem with money in politics. Um, and, but even though that was defeated, it still has had a huge impact in the, in the kinds of federal proposals that we're seeing from different candidates. Like what, what you've in, done in Washington State, what you've done in Seattle is already reshaping the national debate. Um, as I said earlier, I, you know, I think that if you are able to take this Green New Deal resolution and actually you know, roll it out on the ground as policy and and, and have a sort of shining example of what it means, um, you know, it, especially in a city with as much inequality as Seattle, right, with so many incredible challenges around housing. Um, you know, I think people still have this difficulty where for so long we've talked about climate, po climate action being just about carbon policy, right? And so people have an idea in their head that any action on climate is just sort of like a singular anti-pollution measure. Um, the thing about a Green New Deal is it's, it's, it's an infrastructure plan, it's a jobs plan, it's a housing plan, it's a transit plan, it's the next economy, right? Um, and, and, and I think that's so far from how we've done politics in this very siloed way for the past half century that People can't, even the politicians who claim they support it, can't really wrap their heads around it. So, you know, you hear some of the champions of the Green New Deal in, in you know, running, running to lead the Democratic Party will still sort of list it on a, as a laundry list, right? And it's sort of like Medicare for all, Green New Deal, you know, and it's like, well, actually it's, 
sort of the container, like it has Medicare for all in it, it has your housing policy in it, it should have your foreign policy in it as well, right? Um, so it has, should have your immigration policy in it as well. Um, so, so I think Seattle could, you know, could be that beacon, and I think the way to do that is to look at the cities that are doing it best. And I think we have some, really, you asked me about local examples, I mean, I'm inspired by some of what Barcelona has done with the creation of these super blocks where they get cars out and they take green space back and they have affordable housing. P Paris, the mayor of Paris has um, done some really interesting work with green um, affordable housing, low cost housing in the center of Paris as opposed to just constantly pushing um, low income people to the outskirts of the city. <clears throat> Um, you know, we have, we have European cities that have made transit free. Um, you know, if you want people to use transit, make it free. Um, so that might be a big, it's a big ask uh, with current funding models. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I think we need to take these sort of best examples, weave them together. Um, you know, some of the, the best examples of, of, of climate justice come from indigenous communities um, that are, you know, have been ravaged by extraction and are bringing renewable energy to their communities, owned and controlled. My friend Melina Labucan Massimo um, uh, who is Cree and she's been part of, um, she's Lubicon Cree and her community has just been ravaged by tar sands extraction. She brought an incredible solar project to her community. There's a project that's going on now in Standing Rock, so we need to lift this up. Um, uh, yeah, but you know, what I think needs to happen now in terms of building power is I think we need this, these sort of local examples where we get like living examples of what a Green New Deal looks like. But I also think we need sectoral organizing where, um, you know, I, in, I, I'm living in the States now, but when I was in Canada, we started this group called The Leap. Um, it was based on the Leap Manifesto. Some of you know about it. It's sort of like a proto-Green New Deal. We started working with the Postal Workers Union on what, like, what it would mean to take these principles and apply it to the post office because they were facing all kinds of pressures, privatization and so on. But instead of just saying, don't do that, they said, let's reinvent the post office. So they came up with this incredible plan for you know, electric charging stations outside of every post office, solar panels on every roof, a domestically made electric vehicle fleet. Um, more than that, they said, well, maybe we don't just deliver the mail. Maybe we also are delivering locally grown produce and checking in on the elderly. And we're doing postal banking, so maybe we're lending to communities to do community-controlled renewable energy. I think we should be doing this in education, health, you know, tech, right? We need, we, need to, we need to make this vision specific to every single sector. And that's why I'm super excited about what's going on in tech. The Amazon workers have, they started, it's now spread to Microsoft, to Google. We're starting to see tech workers coming together and say, this is what we think our sector should be, right? Um, and, and organizing and building power, you know, in a way that is unprecedented in that sector. So I think that's how we build power. We localize it in, like, in, in, in localities, but also in sectors, and we get very specific. Uh, that sounds fascinating. I'm so excited. Just last month, we had an article talking about how we wanted to mirror what was happening in Barcelona with these super blocks. So folks, there's something on the horizon. Looking forward to, to moving forward. And you heard it right here. That's a Green New Deal element. Um, but let's talk about why that hasn't happened yet. We have some good examples of where we've seen progress. We have obviously uh, incremental change that has happened little by little. And uh, we run the risk of people patting themselves on the back, checking the box, walking away. What is it about the power dynamics, the challenge to our political system and, frankly, our economic system that you would like to sort of extrapolate from your book. I think one of the things that you've constantly talked about is how at the center of the fight that we have to have, it's really a fight against capitalism. Um, and so as we think... <laughs> as we think about our efforts to combat climate change, 
uh, you've called on us to see this as inseparable from our efforts to restructure our economic systems and our political systems. So uh, would you talk a little bit about how you see these intricately connected and how the Green New Deal could potentially offer us an opportunity to challenge these systems that have left so many out? Yeah, so I mean, I have, I've been making this argument for a while, and this is sort of the central thesis of this changes everything, is that um, if we want to understand why we have talked so much and done so little um, when it comes to, to, to the climate crisis, I mean, emissions are still going up, even as we talk and talk and talk, and even as we can sort of pat ourselves on the back, it's like, you know, for, we've had a big protest, but... Ultimately, what matters is, is the carbon, and the carbon is still going up year after year after year. Um, and, and so the, I think we have this case of just unbelievably bad historical timing, where this crisis lands on our lap you know, in the late 1980s. That's when governments first start meeting. That's when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is formed. That's when the UN Climate Convention is signed. Um, and it, and if we think about what else was going on in that, it, in it precisely those years, 1988, 1989, this is the ascendant moment of the neoliberal project. This is, you know, there is no alternative, Margaret Thatcher is saying, the end of history has arrived, says Francis Fukuyama, like, it, it, you know, and there is one recipe, and it is privatization, deregulation, you know, low taxes for the rich and for corporations, and we're going to pay for it by slashing the public sphere. And if you look at what we actually need to do, we need massive investments in the pub public sphere. We need to tell corporations they're not allowed to dig up all that carbon that is still very profitable for them. Um, we need to pay for this huge transformation, which can only come through a just tax system, through cuts to military spending as well. Um, and we need to manage our economy, right? And we've been told, well, we just need to get out of the way and let, let it all trickle down. So this is why I think, you know, when o the Obama administration found themselves in a situation where, like, the global economy melted down, they actually had control over the banks if they'd wanted it. They had to, they bailed them out to the tune of trillions of dollars. They had control of the auto companies because they also had to bail them out. They had control of the insurance companies. It, and they were able to write a massive stimulus bill. If they had wanted to, they actually could have introduced a Green New Deal. And a lot of us were saying, you should do it now. You're, you're never going to have a moment like this. And I think they were too ideologically locked in. It requires a different attitude towards governing. You cannot be afraid to manage. You cannot be afraid to plan. You have to have an industrial strategy. You cannot just believe that your job is to get out of the way, right? And so, because that's what got us into this. And so, what, get, what makes me hopeful is that I do believe there's a new generation of politicians right now um, who are not afraid to govern. <laughs> um, and, and I think that they, who understand that one of the very urgent things we need to do is we need to get money out of politics. And I think, you know, when I see what is happening in these, just these municipal elections, it is such a travesty, right? Um, you know, part of what we've been doing with the fossil fuel divestment movement all this time is at least delegitimizing the money from this sector, right? Um, so, you know, every time we go out there and we make the argument that, that, you, that public interest institutions should not be investing in fossil fuel companies, we're saying this is, this is an immoral business model. These are immoral companies. It's the same as investing in, you know, tobacco companies. And the end game of this is not that we think we're going to bankrupt the fossil fuel companies through fossil fuel divestment. Part of the end game is we make these companies so toxic that no politician can take their money, and I believe no media outlet should take their money, right? Like, in the same way that we don't have, you know, tobacco ads on, on television, we should not have fossil fuel ads on television, and then they wouldn't be able to pollute our democracies in the way they have in Washington State. Um, so this is part of it. Um, but we do ultimately, we, we have a structural crisis that goes beyond neoliberalism. And, you know, it is about exactly what Greta Thunberg said at, at, at the United Nations um, a couple days ago. You know, she said this is that you're telling fairy tales of endless growth. Um, and it is a fairy tale. It's actually a nightmare. It's not a fairy tale. Um, there are parts of our 
of our society, of our economy that we can expand, that are low carbon. You know, when you and I were talking about this, the, the work of care is low carbon. Art is low carbon. Like, let's plan the parts of our economy that where we can have abundance, where we can have, and, and, and this happens to be some of the parts of our, of our, of our societies that, that improve quality of life and all the research shows it. But we can't have limitless disposable consumption, right? Um, there are limits to how green technology can be if we're addicted to technology and everything we do, right? Like there are going to be things that we have to scale back and change and we have to be honest about that. And that's where I think the, the, we really are talking about a different kind of economy. We are talking about something that is not capitalism, yeah. Mm -hmm. Eco-socialism, maybe. Eco-feminist socialism? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would follow up question to that. Um, I've heard you talk about how the term Green New Deal was chosen intentionally so that people could envision that this type of radical change, this type of big scale policy change that we need is possible, hearkening back to the New Deal. Can you talk a little bit about the similarities between the time, both the uh, socioeconomic time, uh, uh, era that was experienced when the New Deal passed and the political realities, the challenges that the grassroots movement had put on those you know, who were in power at the time, and what we see in terms of parallels now, you mentioned rampant inequality, more inequality than we've seen since the Gilded Age, the type of fire that you mentioned that we see in the streets calling for action. What are the similarities between uh, the era of the New Deal and now? And then could you also comment on what are some lessons learned so we don't leave communities out, especially our black and brown and indigenous workers and communities um, like had been done in the past? How have we learned from that experience and what would we like to see uh, if, when we move forward uh, with this Green New Deal? Yeah, so the original, I mean, there have been big debates in, um, in, in, in different climate movements about whether or not we should even invoke the original New Deal because there were so many people left out, right? Um, many African American workers were left out, um, domestic workers were left out, agricultural workers were left out. Um, the most vulnerable workers were left out, so overwhelmingly work workers of color and women. And there was also systemic discrimination because it was introduced during Jim Crow. So in the southern states, there was rampant discrimination in the allocation of relief, like which families got relief and which families didn't. African American families were discriminated against, Mexican families were discriminated against. Um, so an argument could be made that we should just throw out the whole thing because it, you know, it, these are not little flaws, it's big. Um, in the text of the uh, resolution that Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey um, drafted, it's very specific about, th this, is, th this is not an attempt not just to not repeat the exclusions, but actually repair the systemic injustices left behind in part by those exclusions, right? So there's a lot of language um, about, yes, it's core, it's absolutely core, that we need a Green New Deal that is for everyone and that is, that, that is, that is a reparative, that, that is, you know, that if we are going to change everything about how we live and that is what we need to do, then why wouldn't we seize that opportunity uh, to build a radically fair society at the same time and redress the wounds that date back to the founding of our country. I mean, that to me is what this moment is about. Um, and what's amazing to me is I still hear from sort of narrow climate folks, you know, saying like, why are you making it more complicated? You know, climate action is hard enough. Why are you weighing it down with all this racial justice and gender justice and economic justice? Can't we just save the planet and then we'll worry about all that? And the thing that these guys, and they literally are all guys, do not understand <laughs> is like the people who are going to fight for this are the people who have the most to gain from it, right? Um, and we've, the kind of change that we're talking about, even if we're only talking about the carbon, 
is going to be the fight of our lives. I mean, you know that. You, you have put forward great climate policies and, and have had them defeated by the power of the fossil fuel sector. Let us not kid ourselves that this is a fight. So who's going to fight for this, right? What, what is going to be the fire of that? What do people fight for? They fight for, they fight for jobs. They fight for justice. They fight for um, clean air and water and life. And so the people who have them, the people whose, whose communities are most neglected, right? If, if, if those communities are truly centered, if those communities are truly leading, then this is going to be a winning movement. This is going to be, this is going to be a movement with that kind of power. And you mentioned the New Deal and, you know, the New Deal, yes, there were many exclusions, but there, but, but there were also many really important programs, social security, unemployment insurance, um, the civilian conservation corps, because it wasn't just an economic crisis, it was also an ecological crisis, the Dust Bowl, mass deforestation in, in the 1930s. The Civilian Conservation Corps planted 2.3 billion trees. That's more than half the trees ever planted in this country. Um, so, you, you know, I mean, chances are, you know, Americans, you know, drop their kids off at schools that were built under the New Deal. Um, take, we take our books out of libraries that were built under the New Deal. Not, they're not all built by Rem Koolhaas. And this is, um, it, you know, it, it transformed the, 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 the landscape of this country. And I think it is still worth invoking because what I see most when I talk to people around this, it, like I don't, our biggest obstacle is not the climate change denials. The biggest obstacle is the war on the imagination that, that, that 50 years of neoliberalism has left us with. And people are told all the time still that we can't do this, that it's human nature to only think short term and to only look after ourselves. You know, this is what Jonathan Franzen just wrote in The New Yorker. And what the New Deal tells us is that it reminds us that there are lots of different ways of being human, that we're complicated, we, you know, we're capable of collective action. Um, and, and so I think it is still worth doing. Uh, it's still worth invoking despite all of the caveats, because it is so important for us to just have that historical memory revived. To me, one of the most exciting things about the original New Deal was the role of art. Um, you know, it created an artistic renaissance in this country. Hundreds of thousands of pieces of works of art, tens of thousands of works of theater, you know, hundreds and hundreds of murals. Um, all of this is low carbon work, you know? I mean, we should embrace it as such. but. Coming back to the question of power, which we can't forget, this wasn't handed down from on high. If you look at you know, collective organizing and strikes in particular, what you see is in the period that FDR was rolling out the New Deal, you, every year you had more strikes, 34, 35, 36, 37. The number of strikes are increasing as people are getting more ambitious and demanding more. Um, so to me, this is why the, the New Deal is the best historical analogy as opposed to something like the World War II mobilizations, right? When you also saw huge transformations in, you know, how factories were producing goods and so on. Those were top-down transformations. The New Deal was the push and pull of social movements and politicians ready to be pushed, right? And that's, that's, what, that's the sweet spot we need to find. We need to elect people who are ready to be pushed, that are porous, uh, to social movements, and then we need to push like hell. I really appreciate that context. Um, I absolutely agree with you that it's worth invoking, and you've talked about this a little bit. Um, one of the other you know, reasons that you talk about in your book that it's worth invoking is the role that it provides workers, with worker stability, the income inequality that we have now, um, the need for good, stable jobs, the need for good union jobs yeah. is something that you call out in the Green New Deal as we're covering it and discussing it. And in Seattle, it wouldn't be Seattle if we didn't talk about our labor roots and our proud, proud um, labor history, uh, our desire not just to, you know, make sure that everybody has a good job, but that they have a union job and that we, everyone has the right to collectively bargain, because all work has dignity and all workers deserve respect. So 
In recognition of our labor roots here, our recent uh, struggles that we've won, uh, the fight for 15, paid sick and safe leave, I had the chance last year to introduce the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, the first ever city-level <laughs> Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. And I love how you talk about that being um, a workforce development angle, being um, how we get more people into low carbon jobs. I think that's fascinating. would love to hear more about that. And as we think about the national dialogue, a lot of the criticism that either the far right or um, climate deniers or even folks in the center would like union members to think is that the Green New Deal is somehow a threat to their job or a threat to their livelihood. And we're really proud. We're really proud of our Washington State Labor Council friends who are in the house, AFL-CIO over there, um, Martin Luther King County Labor Council. Thank you for being here. You mentioned some of the new organizing that's happening, uh, Google and tech workers and Amazon workers who who not only struck, but went out to support the youth and looked at this intersectional movement that you're talking about. So the ways in which we're trying to lift up non-organized sectors, including for our app-based drivers, we've got a lot of work to do here. And at the same time, our organized sector grew by a full percentage point last year, 19.8% union density in Washington state. At the national level, though, we saw it decline yet again. And so how can we have both a local conversation around how the Green New Deal could infuse opportunities for organizing, for good living wage jobs, for union jobs, and also combat this false narrative that it will take down union work or somehow harm the livelihoods of folks? Um, how can we change that narrative and create this powerful coalition between environmentalist union members, community, uh, that we really need to take on this fire? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's one of our toughest struggles. I think that the, the, the AOC Markey resolution um, is really strong in that it talks about wage and benefit guarantees for workers who are transitioning from one sector to another, um, because I think there is a bad history, if we're honest, in the environmental movement really treating all, sort of all jobs as interchangeable, right? So it's like, oh yeah, you're gonna lose your high carbon job, but here there's like lots more work, you know, jobs in, you know, wind and solar and not paying attention to the fact that those, many of them are non-union jobs, um, paying like $13 an hour, precarious jobs, you know, not, fighting figures like Elon Musk, who is a union buster, is opening auto plants where, you know, he's offering workers, I don't know, what was it, like a roller coaster instead of a union or, um, but, but the climate justice movement, we all, we have to be fighting for labor rights. We have to be showing up for workers, including UAW right now, when workers are fighting for their jobs in these sectors. Um, and we also need like creative solutions, like in Canada right now, there's an auto plant that's being shut down and there's a proposal for it to be taken over by its workers, turned into a cooperative and make electric vehicles, you know? Um, so we need creative alliances. We need to show up for each other because I think there's been enough mistakes made that even when it says very clearly in all the Green New Deal, you know, language, it's union jobs, it, you know, benefit and salary guarantees, democratic participation in retraining programs, um, that it's, it, it, there's, there have been enough mistakes made that it's easy to just lie about it, right? So um, we have to, I don't know, I honestly think we need, we, we need to rebuild trust. There, I, I know that the Green Movement has made mistakes. I also think we need to hold labor leadership accountable when they are acting in the interest of their bosses and not in the interest of their workers. Um, and, and you know, there, you know, there has been some of that, but, but let's say, but, but we also ha need to recognize that SCIU has come out in favor of the Green New Deal, National Nurses United just voted in favor of the Green New Deal. Um, and we, there's a lot of work to be done in, um, in expanding those sectors that that are where it's not as big of a fight, so you know, I, I was telling you that we're doing an event at the university where I teach 
called Care Work is Climate Work, bringing together teachers, nurses, domestic workers, disability rights act, a, advocates, um, and looking at the care economy as a whole and saying, okay, look, a lot of this is low carbon work. We know how to make it even more low carbon. Um, it should be higher paid. It should be, all of it should be unionized. And let's make these better jobs, right? Um, so that's part of it. Um, you know, I think we also need way better protection for migrant workers who overwhelmingly are, um, you know, my friend Saket Sony, who works for the National Guest Workers United, um, he, you know, he talks about um, migrant, the migrant workforce as, as the disaster resilience force because these are the folks who are cleaning up after every major disaster um, and then often getting deported, right? So I think we need, I think, yes, we need to protect union jobs, but because rates of unionization are so low nationally, we also need to reach well beyond the organized trade union sector, and we need to have a really broad definition of workers and be fighting for protections for all workers. And I've heard, I've heard you um, talk about the term uh, climate apartheid, the individuals who are either doing the cleanup uh, after disasters or, for example, you mentioned the smoke that we saw here in Washington State and how farm workers had to go out and still do the farm work in those conditions. And you spoke on Democracy Now! about how those individuals were just you know, sent away, sent home with zero um, assistance and help, and it was like they were a commodity instead of an actual human. Uh, you've long written about uh, how the global south has been the people who've suffered the most under climate change and also individuals from communities of color and low-wage workers uh, being the ones who suffer the most uh, under climate change. Those who've done the least to create climate change are suffering the most from somebody else's crimes and um, continuation, perpetuation of uh, extreme carbon emissions and perpetuating climate change. So as we think about the equity element that you just raised, the need to make sure that workers uh, from communities of color, our frontline and fence line communities are really centered in this. Um, and as we think about how we pull together this coalition and make sure that black and brown and indigenous and low income folks who are living in distressed regions or being forced to move out of their cities or their farmlands into larger cities like this, we have an opportunity to challenge the status quo, bring in these folks and make sure that they're at the center of our movement. And as we do so, we have to recognize we're up against huge battles. You talked about the large coalition that can be formed when we don't exclude people, the folks who've been the most impacted by this, being at the center, being the ones who will fight this. And one of the things that you say we have to fight is eco-fascism and climate barbarism. Um, help us understand what those terms are and what we're up against as we build this inclusive coalition of environmentalists, communities of color, uh, workers, broadly speaking, and unions? Yeah. Um, all right, well, that's a big question. Um, I think that, so I think, I think what we're seeing, and this is what I was saying in my opening remarks, you know, I think what we're seeing on the borders, and here I'm not only talking about the U.S. southern border, but, you know, what is happening in Europe where thousands upon thousands of people have been left to drown in the Mediterranean, where, um, where it has been made illegal to rescue people who are drowning, um, where you know, Italy ha was not letting boats filled with migrants dock in their ports and instead had offshored uh, the, the patrolling of the seas to what they call the Libyan Air Force, for, the Libyan um, uh, uh, Coast Guard, which is a bit of a joke, um, because these are warlords and they are, take migrants to concentration camps in Libya where rape and torture is rampant. And um, so, you know, I, I think if we look at what the Trump administration has done, there's a really clear pattern. First of all, one of the first things they did is they um, have attacked people who have temporary protected status, TPS, right? Haitians, Salvadorans. Temporary protected status is a way of giving people status in the United States because 
something extreme is happening, has happened in their home countries. And these are usually civil wars or natural disasters. And so what's significant about that is that you had, there are a lot of migrants from Central America who were displaced by Hurricane Mitch, Haitians displaced by the earthquake. Um, these are the, this, because climate migrants are not recognized under international law, TPS is the only way that somebody who has um, been displaced by a natural disaster can get status in the United States. And one of the very first things the Trump administration did was attack TPS. And so if you look what happened in the Bahamas, right, where you, I'm sure people saw those horrible videos of people from the Bahamas being refused, um, you know, uh, um, entry to the United States, they had to get off boats, um, and they've made it very clear they're not going to give them temporary pr protected status, right? So at the same time as you have cuts, cuts of hundreds of millions of dollars on, in aid, um, you, ha you have attacks on temporary protected status, which is the only way that people impacted by natural disasters have been able to get status in the United States. Um, and now what the U.S. is trying to do is get countries like El Salvador to, um, to detain migrants and build camps. So they're trying to offshore it, right, even though there's no ocean. This is what the European Union has done. They've offshored it to Libya. Australia has offshored it to these islands, Nauru and Manus, where you have these island detention camps. So the idea is to keep people from ever getting to your country because you turn other countries into prisons, okay? This is happening globally. And this is what, you know, this is what I think climate apartheid looks like. This is what I'm calling climate barbarism. I'm not saying everybody who's moving is moving because of climate change, but what I am saying is that our countries are aware that we are entering or we are in an era of mass human mobility because large parts of the southern hemisphere are being made uninhabitable. And this is how they are proposing to deal with it. I think this should be understood as climate change adaptation. It's just not the kind of, kind of climate change adaptation that we want. Um, what terrifies me about about the era that we are in, it's not just the weather. It's how the weather intersects with brutal economic and political systems that rank human life based on race, based on income, um, and deems certain people disposable. We already do that. There are already millions of people incarcerated, already so many people are having their lives ranked and disposed of. But what we're talking about is this happening on an unfathomable scale. Um, and, and so, you know, what I think we're talking about here is what kind of humans we're going to be as we enter the age of climate disruption. And there's really two imperatives. One of them is we need to do everything possible to keep warming as low as we possibly can. And that's really, really hard. And that's what we've been talking about. But the other thing we need to do is we need to hold on to our humanity as the shocks come. Um, and we need to build societies that value care, that value solidarity. We have to weave that into the kinds of societies we build. And this is why, you know, something like healthcare is not an add-on to the Green New Deal. Like, what we see, you know, in Puerto Rico after Maria, right? Like what, what killed thousands of people was not the storm. What killed thousands of people was having a completely collapsed infrastructure, including healthcare infrastructure. So that, you know, when the electricity goes down, but it wasn't, you know, the whole thing collapsed. And, 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 and this is the legacy of decades of austerity and, 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 and colonial economic relationships, right? So, when we talk about investing in healthcare, investing in education, you know, investing in the sort of the glue of community, this is what's going to, this is what's going to allow us to be human <laughs> as things get rough. And we really do need to be honest that, that things are going to get rougher than they are right now. Um, we are at one degree warming. We, our best case scenario is 1.5. A much likelier scenario is two, right? So these investments in social infrastructure and, and really in, in, in having a, a real 
conversation about whether we believe every human being has value do, do we, or, or not, right? Because like, this, is, this is a conversation that is not something that, 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 that is just about policy. Like, we need faith leaders, we need spiritual leaders to help us find our best selves. Um, and, you know, what's, this is what I'm, I'm truly scared of, is, is what this intersection, if we, if we just accept that, yeah, we let people die because they don't have health care or, um, you know, because they don't have status or whatever it is, all of that just gets so much worse within the context of a warming world. Um, just a quick follow-up and then I have one more question and yeah. I'd love to have the folks from the audience questions queued up. Um, but you did mention that this was not something that happened overnight. There was decades of um, neglect, inaction, and intentional policies that were imposed from the US, I think, on other countries. Can you talk a little bit just as a precursor? Because I think sometimes we have historical amnesia, right? Mm -hmm. We think, oh my goodness, Trump is so terrible, and he is terrible. Um, <laughs> but we want to remember that no matter who's sitting in that office, we still have structural issues, structural issues that are rooted in, um, in exclusionary policies that are intentionally imposing privatization, neoliberal trade policies on other country, um, stripping people of their basic human rights. So no matter who's sitting in that office, can you talk a little bit about the structural policy changes that you see embedded in the Green New Deal that we have to remember to undo? Because it's not just this president that we need to take out of office, but we do actually need to change the very function of how the U.S. imposes conditionalities on these other countries. You mentioned El Salvador and Guatemala earlier. Um, any precursors that we really saw that led up to this massive migration and the massive call for action now so that we don't think it was just the Trump administration? Yeah, well, God, that's also a huge question, Teresa. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we, the, the, these countries that are on the front lines of this, right? I mean, the, 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 the vulnerability has to do with, yes, decades of structural adjustment policies um, that were attached to, uh, to loans that were provided by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, um, some cases directly from, by the US government, um, which, which said, okay, we'll give you a loan, but in exchange, um, you need to privatize your essential services, um, you, you, know, you need to adopt these agricultural practices, you know, make yourself a market for US agribusiness companies, whatever it is, but this, um, the, 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 clo the closer you are to the edge, the more that, you know, a couple years of drought means that you don't have any buffer. And that is, you know, all, all of that is besides, you know, direct military interference, like with, with Honduras, um, where a lot of people are coming from. I mean, the U.S participated in a coup d'etat not so very long ago in Honduras, um, where, you know, Hondurans elected a government that was introducing land reform. And, you know, that in the history of U.S. coups in, in Latin America and around the world, this has been one of the major reasons why the U.S. interferes in people's democracies, is when those democracies start introducing land reform and giving people you know, more control over their destinies. And, and um, so, so, yeah, this didn't start with Trump. This goes incredibly deep. Um, it can make us feel hopeless, because it's a lot. Um, but it's why, you know, I do have concerns that some of the discussion around a Green New Deal has been much too nationalist. Um, I, you know, I know, I'm sure there are, I don't want to get into, you know, who's our favorites in the primaries and so on, but I'm a Bernie gal, and I am Bernie gal. <laughs> you know, and I'll tell you, like, the main reason I am is because I really feel that he is the only candidate who has, um, who's approaching this with an internationalist lens. 
I think Warren has some fantastic climate policies that she, a lot of which she got from Inslee, and that's great. But she's talking, her, her, her green manufacturing plan is called, um, it's called, what is it called? Um, economic, not economic nationalism? Is it called, is it called economic nationalism? Page, economic patriotism, sorry. Economic patriotism. And, you know, what she's saying is, we're going to build a lot of green tech and we're going to help the world by giving them our green tech, which actually sounds a lot like economic imperialism. Um, because every country has a right to develop. And these relationships where the US is, you know, or Europe is the, you know, the, the, the manufacturer of the finished goods and they're just dumped on the global south creates you know, it, 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 it continues these relationships of dependency that we've seen for far too long. Um, so what we actually need is to have, you know, open copyright on green tech so that everybody can build their own tech. Um, and we need direct aid, right? So, I mean, Ber Bernie, Bernie is talking about $200 billion in direct climate assistance to the global south. That is the scale that we need. Um, and, and that is what's gonna catalyze the change, right? Because what you hear from a lot of folks is like, you know, we know we can't solve this on our own, right? This is an international crisis um, and we have an international architecture around climate action for a reason. And that international architecture says that the countries that have been emitting the most longest have more responsibility to solve it and also have to help those countries that are on the front line to deal with the impacts of climate change, to leapfrog to fossil fuels, and we need to help them keep their forests intact, right? So if we want these carbon sinks to stay sand standing and we don't want you know, governments to allow corporations to fell forests in order to dig up oil and gas, then it can't just be on them to sacrifice that revenue and not pull their people out of poverty. We need to help keep those forests intact, not with offsets, but with direct, no strings attached financing. Now, it's very tricky in terms of how we get this money out there because, you know, it going directly to governments often doesn't work. We need to get it to communities. There are ways of doing this, but there's no way for the US to lead by example without actually paying up. I want to be very <laughs> clear <laughs> about this. Um, I think the U.S. can be a catalyst, but it can only be a catalyst if it, if it is a true moral leadership. And that moral leadership means paying our climate debts. That means financing. That means offering asylum to climate refugees. It means completely reimagining our borders. Um, and so those are, the, I would say, the really two... two the, 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 the two key factors. So I don't mean to piss off any Warren fans. I like her too. Um, but I don't think, for instance, that we can green the military. Um, you know, I think that the, the US military is the single largest driver of ecological disruption on this planet. Um, so we, we just need to be real about some of this. So, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, so let's bring this home a little bit uh, more locally and then we'll turn it over to audience questions. You've written about in your recent book and in past books um, about how this climate instability is really pushing mass migration. You talked about it in your opening and for folks who don't have the book yet, you gotta buy it. It's only been on the market for a week, so make sure you get one today. Um, but as we see more people moving to areas in search of greater stability, we know here in the Pacific Northwest, people are gonna continue to move to the Seattle region. Uh, we will have a relatively more stable climate um, compared to some of the other areas of the country and the world where we see rising sea levels, where we see flooding, where we see droughts, where we see um, deforestation and desertification. So we know people will come here and we also have already seen record amounts of rain just in a 24 hour period. A few weeks ago, we had snowmageddon. Earlier this year, we had two weeks of snow and we hardly ever get snow. Uh, we have record heat where we have cooling centers now. And frankly, as you mentioned in 2017 and 2018, we had to beg for 
clean air facilities, just yeah. so people could breathe clean air. And who's disproportionately affected, right? It's uh, low-wage workers, it's communities of color, it's the folks who are living homeless outside, it's the disability community. For us in the Pacific Northwest, and specifically here in Seattle, we've seen about a thousand people move to this region a week, and that's already occurring. They're coming here as economic refugees, looking for good jobs. They're coming here as climate refugees as well. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we have is we have not been able to respond and build enough affordable housing. And when we do, we're often faced with um, some opposition from local groups and litigation, and I think past lack of political will to actually build the dense housing that we need, the transit options that we need, the mobility options that we need, and ironically, sometimes environmental tools that had the best of intentions are being used as ways to stop affordable housing and density. Help us break apart those silos because when we call for additional housing and more density and more transit options, um, we should not be having those environmental tools used against us because we know the consequences for yeah. all yeah. additional pollution. It's bad for the health of those folks commuting too. How do you marry those two narratives and really help us at the local level think about the global impact of not allowing density and bring those two efforts together so we can have affordable housing, have transit, and we can do it with our environmental passion as well? Wow, okay, that's a huge challenge. Um, but it's interesting because I do think, you know, what you're experiencing is a kind of a microcosm of this, of this really global question, which is like, how are we gonna share the livable parts of our planet that are left, right? And what we see here from the right is, look, we're just looking after our own. We're gonna build fortresses, you know, around, around our borders and around our mansions and protect our own and, you know, who cares about you? Um, and this is why it's a fundamental question, like large parts of this planet and even this country are becoming less and less inhabitable. It's happening already. And we are facing this question of like, how are we gonna live together in less space? How are we gonna share what's left? Um, just because we happen to live somewhere doesn't mean we have more of a right to it than other people just because we were there first, you know? We're all settlers on this land. <laughs> we are all on indigenous land. You know, in Canada, the no one is a legal movement says, you know, no borders on stolen land. And I think it's a pretty good um, slogan. Um, so, so how are we gonna share? Um, and and it ha there has to be more density for the reasons you said, um, because we need that fertile farmland. Um, and, and we need rent control and we need affordable housing. Um, and, and so you know, I think you have a, another opportunity here to lead to show what that really looks like and, 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 and to go through these you know, admittedly difficult navigations. But, you know, climate gentrification, like, like there is no shining Seattle Green New Deal city that isn't frontally attacking gentrification, right? It, because you can have this beautiful green city, um, but it just means that low-income people are being pushed out. Um, they're going to have to drive more. Um, because they're not going to have access to transit. And then in the beautiful green city that has all the great transit, the wealthy people aren't even going to use it because they're all going to take Uber, right? Um, so, you know, we, we there, has, <laughs> there has to be a much, much more integrated approach. Um, and I think that this, you know, comes back to, once again, this sort of issue of money and politics a little bit, right? Because I think it is the wealthiest interests that are fighting, you know, rent control and, you know, trying to get democratic socialists off of your city council. And, you know, it's a bit of a class war going on here in Seattle. Um, and that's nothing new, I guess. But you're up for the fight, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you, and thank you for the reminder throughout about the intersectional need that we have to make sure that our movements really do cross um, issues of uh, class and race and um, economic disparities. So we'll come back to those issues um, before we wrap up, but I know we have a handful of questions. Yeah. Well, so we have run very long and we got a number of very beautifully written questions. So uh, Town Hall, I'm going to commit that we are going to find some way to collate these and help publish them online to keep the conversation <laughs> going. So I actually really, we only have time for one audience question that I think wraps up the theme of a lot of the questions we got. Um, it, it is another big one. How do we build an inclusive movement, movement that is unified and coherent? How can we reconcile disagreements over issues like nuclear power and carbon pricing screen, schemes? Is there even time to do so? Hmm. Hmm. You know, I, <laughs> I think the principles that that frontlines, you know, we use these catchphrases, frontlines, what does it mean, right? It means the people who are directly impacted by policy, right? You know, who have the dirty industry in their backyard, um, whose lands are being ravaged by the extraction, whose bodies are bearing the toxic burden, right? So, you know, if we accept that the people who are most impacted have the right to be at the table and leading decision making, then it answers some of these questions, right? Because I think, you know, the problem with carbon pricing is that it tends to sacrifice people who just aren't at the table, right? So you have this great scheme where it's like, yeah, we're gonna keep, you know, we're gonna keep polluting, but we're gonna plant some trees over there. And, and the people who are still having to breathe the pollution are just not part of that equation, right? And I think the same is true of nuclear. Um, you know, th there are sacrifice, sacrifice zones and sacrificial people that are built into that. Um, I think that we, the wonderful thing is that we actually can do this without nuclear. Um, we actually can, um, and I know there are huge disagreements, you know, I mean, I'm not, like in terms of sequencing, I'm not saying like shut down nuclear plants right now, but in terms of building new nuclear plants, I don't understand why we would be doing that when it is more expensive, it takes longer, um, and is more unjust than renewable energy. So we will follow up to make sure that everybody knows where to find those questions. Um, and I just want to say it's been an incredible honor. Uh, we have talked, covered a lot of ground. One of the things that I would love to hear you uh, wrap up a little bit, you mentioned 2030 in your opening remarks. We've talked a lot about the the importance of that year, 11 years from now. Um, 11 years from now, my daughter-to-be uh, will be 11. Uh, your son will be 18. As you think about what the world looks like and how we create actionable change, how will we measure success and what will you have hoped to see is, as the video says, if we close our eyes and we had the courage to imagine the action that we see there, what would the world look like uh, for our kiddos and for everybody's kids and grandkids out there? Mm, wow. Um, hmm. All right, so we're gonna do some mommy talk. But before we do that, I just want to say one thing, which is that um, before I had before I had um, my son, I used to I used to really um, feel kind of alienated in the environmental movement when I, there were people would always be talking about like we're gonna we're doing it for our kids and you know I, as a mother you know I care about the future and I would be like what, like, you think I don't care about the future because I don't have a kid? You know, I didn't have, I had, I had my first kid when I was 42. Um, so I really don't believe that just being mothers makes us, like, like, care more. Like, if anything, being a mother makes me have less time than my friends who don't have kids and, like, are able to give it their all. So, um, so, so I cared a ton before I became a mom, and I know that you sure did, too. Um, and I want to send lots of love out to, um, to all the uh, folks out there who don't have kids um, and I know care deeply about this planet and this world and, and I'm so grateful to you. Um, so we don't have a monopoly on any of this stuff. And I know that some of my friends without kids just care so fiercely for all of our kids. Um, 
So what I wish for our kids, your 11-year-old and my 18-year-old, is that, you know, in 2030, they really have the wind at their backs, you know? They really feel it and they're really living it. And it's not this sort of abstract conversation. It's just they know that, they know that it creates huge numbers of jobs because they, you know, they, they, they see it all around them. And there are so many of these jobs that the idea that you need to build a wall or restrict immigration is ridiculous because we just have more work than we know what to do with. Um, and, you know, I, in addition to all of the things that we saw in the video, you know, the, that I would wish for them, that sense of solidarity, you know, with, with, with across sectors and, 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 and respect for, for the low carbon work of teaching and caregiving. You know, I want, I want them to have salmon. I want, them to, I want there to be wild salmon in our rivers and oceans. I want there to be orcas. <laughs> I want there to be, you know, our, I want our ancient forests to still be standing. And, you know, one of the things that I feel um, really strongly about is that, you know, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about nature in this context, we can talk about it in a way that makes it seem really scary because we're talking about forest fires and we're talking about terrifying storms and we're talking about these brutal droughts. Um, but it's really, really important for us to remember that nature nurtures us, that we are part of the natural world. We're not at war with it, and nature is not at war with us. Um, nature is not a terrorist. The natural world is not doing this to hurt us. Um, we have upset the balance of the elements. We dug up the earth and we put it in the sky and in the oceans and we have created a great imbalance that now we have to heal, right? We have to heal our relationships with each other and we have to heal the relationships with the land. And my greatest hope, I think, for, for, for my son and your, your daughter to be, yeah, is I want them to be held by the natural world. I don't want them to be at war with nature. I don't want them to see the natural world as a place of threat. I want them to be able to live in a way that they feel the love and care that we are blessed with. Yeah, that's my hope. Excellent. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers, sisters, siblings, let's give it up for Naomi Klein, who Thanks put the everyone. fire in our belly to put the fire out. Thank you to Town Hall for all of your work. My incredible staff over here, my husband and my parents are so inspiring, and you have just made this an incredible night. We will keep fighting that fire with the fire that you lit tonight. Thank you. Naomi Klein, everyone.